Over the last couple of days, I've been undertaking an exclusive review for the shooting show. Sent to me by Scott Country, this is the Optics Identifier, which is the first commercially available thermal rifle scope on the market. He launched a little bit later this year at the CLA Game Fair. Putting it through its paces up in the sky, some of the most rugged terrain around, we've been with Scott McKenzie trying to get in to a couple of foxes to see what this unit is all about and use it in exactly the kind of scenario that it's designed for. What I'll do today is give you a quick run through of how it works, how it operates, how to zero it, um, a few little intricacies of it, and then I'll keep quiet and let you see a little bit of footage of how we got on when we were up in sky. First things first, you need to be able to mount the thermal onto your rifle. Ideally, you want to fit it to a weaver type rail just to give you that flexibility with movement because you're going to need to be able to butt your eye up right against the scope in order to be comfortable. We've got a, a quick detach system built into the scope itself which works very well. Today I've got it mounted on uh, a Ruger American which is a uh, budget Ruger rifle which I have reviewed on the shooting show previously and over the last couple of months I've been shooting it a fair amount. It's been used in all the outings that I've done for the show and it's performing admirably all round. Back to the optics thermal scope and the first thing you're going to want to do is power up. To do that you've got a little wheel on the back. If you undo it, it uncouples the battery carrier tray which comes out here. It's a little snug so you'll have to prise it out a bit. There are two different trays available that come with the unit. We've got this one here which is the smaller of the two and there is also an extendable one which allows you to put four bigger lithium batteries in and give you an extended life. In terms of how well uh, the batteries have lasted, I've been very impressed. Throughout all the filming and shooting that we did on Sky, my initial testing of it and uh, the, the range work that I'm doing today, I've used these same four C123s and according to the unit, we've still got 100% battery, so you can't ask for more than that. We'll just have to see when eventually they run out. I'm going to have to do a bit more shooting before we get there, obviously. With that done and put back in, you then simply need to turn it on. If it's the first time that you've inserted your lithium batteries, you're going to want to do one step before you turn it on, and that is hold the brightness button down at the same time as turning it on. And once you've turned on the unit, continue to hold the brightness button down until the display lights up and then you can let it go. And that just allows uh, the unit to register the fact that you're using lithium batteries. Once you've done it once, assuming that you continue to use it through its life, which you probably will because those are the batteries that it's provided with, you don't need to do it again. With the unit on, there is a slight delay before it uh, lights up, you get the optic sign and then it will click like a camera which is just how it basically sets itself and then you will be able to see the crosshair and have uh, a view and image. The primary button that is going to be of use to you while you're actually operating the unit is going to be the brightness. And the brightness is very simply adjusted by hitting this button at the back. There's three set brightness uh, settings and there is also a manual option as well which allows you to, to tweak it just the way that you want it. If you want to access the menu settings, you do that by depressing these two buttons down at the same time. That will then allow you to, to scroll through reticle, battery type, brightness and NUC type. The only thing that you're going to really want to um, access inside there is going to be the reticle type. The brightness can be accessed outside the menu as I've already explained. So if you go into the, the reticle, now your brightness button is basically your OK button. And inside there we can see uh, position at the top. That is basically stored positions, which actually allows you to zero the rifle scope at different distances and then access those positions in the menu. So what you could do is zero this at 100 yards and if you were forced to take a shot up at 200 yards you would click position 2 for example which was your 200 yard zero. 
Below that, you've got your on-off. You don't have to use this with a crosshair. And in actual fact, the first night that we were in Sky, we didn't have um, time to zero the rifle because we arrived a little bit late. So we opted just to use this thermal imaging scope as a spotter. There's a handle which is t attaches on the side here and it fits nicely in the palm of your hand. And we were just using it to scan with this rifle actually that the scope's on now, set up with the Swarovski scope. Below that, you've got your up, down, left, right. This is how you zero the rifle scope. Now, this is very, very simple to zero. It's basically the same as zeroing in any rifle scope that you will have used before. You can bore sight it just the same, look down the bore, have a look up at, at the crosshair and move it in line with the, the uh, target that you're looking at. The one thing that you will have to bear in mind that because you're moving it on an X and Y axis, it basically just gives you an X and a Y and a coordinate when it's centered at zero and you'll have to move it to positive and negative numbers in order to, to get it on target, is that you've got to treat it like you're actually bore sighting a rifle. So everything's the opposite way around. If you take a shot, as I have done previously here, and your bullet is high, I was about four inches high or so, you actually want to move the reticle up, not down. Once you've done it a couple of times, you'll soon get to grips with it. Uh, the other options are the actual color. So if we scroll down, scroll down that, we have white, we have black, and we have auto. Now, as anybody who has used um, thermal will know, most thermal scopes will give you an option of black heat or white heat. So if you have it on auto, it auto corrects the color of the crosshair to be the opposite um, for whatever you, whatever setting that you've got it on. So once you've got that set, it's probably better just to keep that on auto. Uh, then your next option is the actual type. So you do have a variety of different crosshairs that you can choose from, and that's really down to personal preference. And then lastly, exit, and you're back out to where you started with. And that is really all there is to this scope. Um, it's not overly complicated to use. Uh, if you want to focus it, you've simply got two really nice, easily gripped rings at the front and at the back. The back will focus the actual reticle itself for your landscape focusing you use the ring at the front. And lastly, this port on the side is just a video output. So if you want to capture any of the, the footage um, output from what you're actually shooting, that's where you would plug it in. Moving on to the actual field applications of this unit, the first thing that I need to mention is how you go about zeroing a thermal rifle scope. Now it may seem obvious to some, but you can't simply go and put up a white sheet of paper on your standard shooting board and hope to see what you're looking at. Thermals rely on a difference in temperature to pick up on the screen and identify what the image is that's being shown through the viewer. So if we look at a landscape like this, when we were looking at rabbits up on those banks, the ground and the grass is a lot cooler than the body heat of the rabbits, and that is how you're able to pick it up. And that is also why you can use a thermal during the day. It doesn't need to be cold and at night or dark. It's just differences in temperature that the thermal picks up. So what I've done uh, here is get one of these um, hand warmer pads. These are disposable, they don't cost a great deal. As soon as you take them out of the packet, they immediately start to heat up. And I've pinned one of these to a white sheet of paper on my board. And that is enough um, thermal heat from that to be able to pick it up on the scope and the white sheet of paper just allows me to see if, if my bullet hasn't quite gone where I'm expecting it. And with that pinned up there, you end up with a, a really nice um, central zeroing position to get the rifle on target and where you want it. And I went through that um, process a little bit earlier and within two shots, I was pretty much on the mark and, and very happy with the results. If you don't have um, one of these, what we did up in Sky when we were just checking zero for Scott and Eden um, to have a go of the rifle was we had a, a dog food tin that we had 
pinned to a board again with a white sheet of paper behind it. We've just got a blowtorch and heated up the, the little circular piece of tin which held its heat long enough for us to take a couple of shots at it and check zero. In terms of hunting with the unit, you're probably going to want to restrict yourself to about 200 yards. It's not that it won't pick up heat sources beyond that. I was looking at rabbits at 550 on the hill behind me and there's some cattle in the field up the valley at, in excess of 1500 meters and I could pick them up quite easily with the thermal scope. But you do need to be able to identify with 100% certainty what you are shooting before you pull the trigger. At more than 200 yards with a fox size object it will become increasingly difficult with this and for that reason um, in terms of safety and ethics I would say 200 yards is probably about your limit. You do have the ability to zoom in with this and that's simply operated by pressing this button at the front. Pressing it once doubles uh, the size of the image, pressing it again doubles it further. We found that using the four times magnification you lost a lot of clarity of the image so we didn't find it particularly useful. What we were tending to do was use no zoom to uh, locate what it is that we were looking for and then take it up to two times magnification to place that accurate shot. A little bit earlier I went down the road to an embankment that I know there are a large number of rabbits on uh, causing havoc with the game crop on top of the hill. I did that to get a bit of practice with the thermal scope in this setup. It is very important to do this. As anybody who has used a handheld thermal viewer will know, judging distance at night with a thermal image is incredibly difficult. The best way to do it is to get objects that you know the rough dimensions of and you know what the actual ranges are and see how much of the crosshair they fill. So settle on a crosshair type on the scope that you're going to stick with and with that set over a bit of time and practice especially um, if you're practicing shooting rabbits you will soon get to know what a rabbit or a fox looks like and how much of your crosshair it fills at certain ranges and eventually you'll get to a point where you'll be able to watch foxes coming in and as they cross the point of say 150 yards you know that's a takeable shot uh, with the setup and rifle that you have and the caliber that you're shooting and you'll be able to take that shot knowing what the, the fox image looks like on either no magnification or two times magnification on the unit. But getting that practice in and knowing your ranges um, especially if you're not going to take out a spotlight as well for you to be able to to ping ranges with a rangefinder is going to be very important to make um, efficient and ethical use of a unit like this. Byron with the Optics Thermal Scoping Tour heads back to Sky. He's meeting Eden Anand and Scott McKenzie to try the thermal imager unit out against a marauding fox. A delayed start means that the boys don't have time to zero the unit to tonight's hunting combo, so it'll be used as a handheld spotter, with Scott on lamp and thermal duties and Eden behind the rifle. While Eden takes the more traditional approach with binos, Scott scans with the optics thermal. Without the weight of a rifle to aid us, the sight picture is shakier, but nevertheless, Scott is soon picking up wildlife with ease. Soon enough a fox comes in and begins to make its way down the basin, though all the while staying out of shooting range. Scott, just talk me through what's happened in the last 45 minutes. Right, well, we've come into this area, up on the high ground on the hill here. The, the view out here is great because it's, it's a big, big open basin in front of us, surrounded by a high ridge. And it's a good area to just have a call, a sit and a wait. And uh, I, we've, we've sat for about 20 minutes on and off calling and sure enough, we've had a fox come in. But with the wind, he's, I fear he's just cut us a wee bit. He's just caught our scent, but not enough to spook him. And he's just come round in a big, big arc. 
and sat off about 400 metres away. He was really coming in though, wasn't he? He was, he was coming in thick and fast. He had a trot about him, but uh, like I say, I think the wind's just, it swirls around in this basin. He's just caught a sniff of us and it's, it's just made him a wee bit weary. Using the thermal, how was that? I mean, you've used thermal before, but talk me through the advantages of it tonight. Well, that fox in particular, we were, like I say, we were calling on and off for 20 minutes, and as the lights faded, it's got more difficult to see. And it wasn't until I picked up the uh, thermal imager, switched it on, and had a sweep about that I picked that fox up. I took the thermal imager away from my eye just to, just to see if I could see it with the eye. Couldn't see a thing, but as soon as I put the thermal imager back out there, I, like I say, I mean, it's, uh, I wouldn't have picked that fox up without it, that was for sure. And we were able to drag it for quite some time. It was impossible to pick up with them, with, even with great optics, just impossible. Yeah, even with you know, grade A optics, we, we struggled to pick him out amongst the peat hacks, the grass, the heather. Um, but yeah, testament to the thermal imaging, it's, it's made it possible to see where he's gone to and uh, where he's sat up. So we'll give him a wee while, let the light fade a wee bit and see if we can stalk into him with the lamp and pick him up again. Charlie appears to have given the boys a slip on this occasion, but we've still had an excellent demonstration of what this new unit is capable of. Next time, the fox won't be so lucky.